So at the end of the session, if you have to leave early, please just grab one. Uh, I have these little evaluations that just ask what in the session was useful, what you think could have been left out, um, topics you'd like to see addressed in future uh, workshops like this, and formats that you'd like them to take. Um, so I'd like to apologize first for the fact that we're so crowded. I, I honestly was expecting the people who are in my um, PhD class and some people from uh, Professor Wilkinson's class to come. And so I was expecting a very small group and the response has been really huge. Uh, so this was literally the, the biggest room that was available on campus at this time. Um, so we just have to make the best of it with what we have. You could sort of perch. <laughs> so the plan for today is, um, is basically this. Uh, I have a succession of things that I'll be going through. And then Dr. Wilkinson, who's just sitting back here, has very kindly agreed to talk a little bit about the um, practical strategies for writing clearly and eloquently and well. So in many ways, we're trying to do a lot of things in one moment here. Um, I am going to be mostly talking about some of the apparatuses and technologies that I think might be helpful to you in the process of doing dissertation and thesis writing. Uh, and one of the things that I anticipate some of you are actually looking for here is practical thoughts on writing well, um, which is involved and which the things that I'm mostly talking about I think help facilitate, but it's not the central concern of this workshop. So, um, so that's something that you can write on your survey if you want workshops like that more in the future. <coughs> so as the previous slide said, a lot of what I've what I come to this with is from going to a series of workshops with a woman named Dorothy Duff Brown, who was the sole reason that I got through my dissertation, and the sole reason that a lot of my friends got through their dissertations. And friends not only at the University of California where I did my PhD, but actually all across the United States and into much of Canada. Um, she's sort of a force. So she's who I channel, but I also channel a lot of experience. I was a writing teacher at the University of California for five years. Um, and I've read a lot of this stuff. This is one of the things that I'm really interested in, is how people can write well, clearly, and with ease. I think that writing should be something that actually is not a torment, and not you know hell to go through, but that actually <laughs> something you can enjoy. And so that's one of my main hopes, is that this, this be something that facilitates that. So before you even begin the writing process, one of the things that I want to highlight is the the sort of ad attitudinal stuff that's important in writing. Um, and this is important because writing is something that is in many ways paradigmatically personal. Uh, it's something that if you're actually doing writing that you care about, it is going to be revealing. And at the same time, writing in the graduate school context or at the advanced undergrad context is something that's very public, right? It's something you're being evaluated on. So in that sense, it's a kind of terrifyingly risky endeavor. And it's very brave, it's very courageous. So one of the things that in terms of your attitude, I think it's important to take is a sort of balance between being sincere and full-hearted in your work and being able to think about the feedback and comments that you get on your writing as something that is not actually directly about who you are as a person. And, and this is something that I say of my own experience, right, that, that still, you know, I've been in school now for something like 27 years. And I notice myself taking things that people say about my writing as comments on me. And I suspect that many of you have that experience too. So one of the attitudinal things that I think helps is to in some way relocate the writing process as something that's outside of you. So that you are um, producing this artifact that is something that can be worked on, right? It's something that things can be done in relation to. And so you can use various technologies and tools to work with that thing. Um, so by the way, all of these slides are, are posted on my website. I haven't really intended to have PowerPoint, but so many people couldn't come that I did. So if you um, don't like to write things down quickly, you can always, and you think they're useful, you can always go there. Um, so the view of the thesis or dissertation is to Think about it as a whole. Think about what's happening in it as something that actually is a whole package. 
much of the time, this project is the first long thing that you've done, or it's the longest thing that you'll have done. And the view there sometimes has this quality of like, you're just going to start and just pick at it until somehow you end. And in my experience, that view tends to be something that produces a tremendous amount of anxiety and a tremendous amount of sort of uncertainty about what exactly you're doing. And this is because almost entirely, when you've done writing in the past, it's been something that had a, a word length, a page length, a predetermined object. Um, you know, you were writing at the lab, you were writing, right? You were, you were doing something that was delimited. So this can seem like something that's just going to drift on forever, and that it's just the very beginning and you don't know what the end point is going to be. So you need to take the view of it as a whole, as something that's a package that you're actually going to do, and as something that is fundamentally workable not as something that is so far beyond you that you're never going to be able to finish it. It has to be, you have to understand that this is actually, you have to take the attitude that this is a manageable possible thing for you to do. And I can assure you that actually it is a manageable possible thing for you to do. And it's that way in part because you can make it a manageable and possible thing. So one part of that is that this is a serious thing, you know, it, it matters, but it's also an experiment. And this is something that I think you will find, particularly if you're finishing an undergraduate thesis and planning to go on to a master's, or you're finishing a master's and planning to go on to a dissertation, that everything that you do is something that you're trying out, right? It's, it's experimental. You're, you're giving it a try. You're looking at what is happening. So in that sense, you can be um, serious, but also somewhat playful. And you can feel like the stakes are not so high that, you know, it's a sort of life and death consequence. So that I think involves also understanding that this is something that you're doing, but it's not everything that you are. And I'll talk a little bit more later about the thing that can happen where somehow all you all you do ends up being uh, your work on your thesis, your dissertation, and you don't do things like exercise and eat um, or have hobbies. And, and this is something that you can actually take this attitude and shift right now and be like, I do this.
reading a book or whatever, but you, you make a stake, right? You begin to say something about it. Uh, ideally, you actually type these notes up. And sometimes maybe you just type, just type your opinion about what you've just read or what research you've just done. And you use a tone in those notes that is similar to the tone that you might use in actually writing the dissertation. So when I've done this, it's actually been possible for me to take some of these notes that are just off the cuff, cuff first pass thoughts about something, and almost directly translate them into the dissertation itself. When I, when I think, oh, there was something in that book that might help here, and there's those notes available, you have a snapshot of what you were thinking when you read it, and it really helps you. So the tone that you use is this kind of, the kind of tone that you probably will have in a thesis or dissertation, which is not a frenzied tone, it's a sort of calm tone, it's a reasonable tone. It has a kind of ample quality. You're not rushing through it, you have a quality, you're saying what you think about something. And it's also not cryptic, because one of the things that happens is you read something or you do some research, at one point, and two years later, you're trying to write about it. And you don't wanna just be like, uh, you know, messed up stuff on page 374, exclamation point, you know. You wanna say like, what's messed up about that stuff on page 374? Because later, you're not gonna remember who, you know, what you were talking about. So you wanna, you know, set yourself up for, for that being useful. Okay, so, this is not as workshoppy a workshop as it would be if we were smaller. Um, but everyone, if you have a piece of paper and a pen, uh, come up with a working title for your thesis or dissertation right now, in the next minute. Ready? Go. two and a half. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what happens when you try to do that? One of the things that, I mean, I did it quickly, but even while I'm doing it, I realized I'm in the human studies program, so everything I do is interdisciplinary, and one thing that has been striking me over and over again is how words mean different things in different disciplines, so yes. I'm, I'm writing for, for for a literary discipline and a social policy discipline, and you take a simple a simple word like story that has mm -hmm. an incredibly different ramification. So even in making a title, I feel almost like I've got to explain every major word. Yeah. In title. But I've been so, feeling that way for some time now, and I'm getting comfortable with it. Right. So this is this is the problem where words really mean, and titles are weak. Right. They they matter. One of the reasons to do some of this work is that you have to make decisions. And there is no reason to postpone making decisions. So even if you're making a title that has those kind of charged words and you feel like, how can I even say this? How many meanings of story are there going to be for the people who are reading this title? You do that anyway. And you make some decisions about, do you want to try a really, you know, a really descriptive title? Or do you want to have something that's more creative? <coughs> And let me just tell you, if you don't start doing this now and going through multiple drafts of your titles, you're gonna end up with a title like my MA thesis, which I will tell you, although it's mortifying. Mm -hmm. It was, giving name to the nameless, colon, heterodox non-propositional understanding and implicit aspects of political transformation. <laughs> right, like, really bad, you know? <laughs> like, in so many ways. So, this is something to just look up. But it's not just because you don't wanna have a bad title, it's because Making those kinds of decisions are things that are, they give you footholds into doing the work. So another foothold that I'd like you to try to write down. Come up with a number of pages that you think this is gonna be. Just like when a teacher says, write a 25 page paper. How many pages do you want to use to dissertation? How many? 
How many chapters do you want to have? <laughs> some, in some disciplines, you know exactly how many chapters you need to have, right? You have a, you have a literature review, you have a research design, you know. Right, so those things you might not need to, so you're not, do you have a, a Well, my, set? The, the school I'm at, they have a format for six chapters. Six chapters, they are. right. So that's good. In a certain way, like, having to make fewer decisions is very annoying. Um, we're not going to do the part about this that is a cognitive map of the dissertation, but I recommend you try this out. Uh, has anyone not heard of co cognitive mapping? Cognitive, cognitive mapping is where you take a piece of paper, preferably a big piece of paper, and you take some kind of marking instruments, preferably colored markers, and you begin with, say, the central concept that you're going to explore in the piece of institution. And you write that um, somewhere on the piece of paper. You don't know where to put it. You might put it right in the middle. And then you begin to put in some of the other concepts that are happening. And you draw lines to show connections between concepts, or you, you know, do other kinds of visual markings. Um, you cluster concepts together, you draw circles around some of them. So basically what you're doing is making a nonlinear uh, visual representation of what you're thinking about. And the virtue of this is twofold. It snaps you out of your sort of linear mode of thinking about things, which is a good thing even for people who know that they're going to have six chapters. Because if you have a particular narrative line that you are always following, uh, you might include things where that line is uh, not adequate to the work that you actually want to do. So when you make it in this sort of other format, it allows you to see differently how things are related to each other. And it might turn out that that really changes some of the ways that you're, um, you're writing about it. And I'll have a few other things that work like this too. But especially if you're sort of at the early stages of thinking about a thesis or dissertation, Cognitive mapping is a really effective way to try to see what you actually care about. And it might be something different than right now you think is going to happen. So in that respect, it's also very useful to formulate a table of contents. So once you have an idea of how many chapters you will include, and this is again something that I think it's good to decide just provisionally right now, you actually write that down in a table of contents mode. A table of contents is very different than an outline. An outline for a lot of people is something that begin with and you write from the outline. And so an outline is something that is sort of endlessly alterable and add, you can add into it. A table of contents has a quality that's more fixed. It's a decision that's been made that you don't need to worry about. And these are the kinds of decisions that uh, it's useful to make. So to basically, what I'm trying to advocate here, and I realize that I'm being very opinionated, and let me just say, and I meant to say this earlier, just because I'm very opinionated doesn't mean that I'm right. And you know, anything that I'm saying here is just, if it's useful, use it, right? Um, and if it's not useful, then just pitch it. You know. um, but, I, but I do believe these things. <laughs> so formulating a table of contents is something that gives you a delimited, real way to say, this is what I'm going to do. And then later, if you change it, you change it. You know, often you'll find that you start writing a chapter, and you think that it's going to be one of three chapters, and it turns out that it, you know, that chapter is 80 pages long. And it's got three parts, and it's the whole, you know, it's the whole MA thesis. That, that happens, and it's okay when that happens. Then you just write a different table of contents. So the other thing to find out kind of early is if there are, if there are, and usually there are, institutional guidelines for formatting the thesis or dissertation. And the reason to do that, this is that it is a truly horrible thing to come to the last couple of weeks of working on a project that you've put a lot of work into and discover that you need to reformat the whole thing because the margins that they're asking for are 1.75 inches on one side, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5 on all the other sides, and then Word has done something completely strange to your footnotes, and you know you're, you can't make the table of contents line up. You know, so if you know the formatting guidelines early, you can start actually just put the document in those formatting guidelines right now. Right. So as you're writing it, it's already the thing that it's going to be. It's already becoming the thing it's going to be. Uh, and so I guess what I'd say for that specifically here is, um, as far as I know, grad studies does have a sheet, and I can I can send around an example if you want to see this. Um, 
you want to see a thesis and dissertation tips sheet? Um, send around two things from my institution. Um, my old institution. Which were dissertation and thesis tips, and then dissertation and thesis preparation guidelines. And I'm sorry, I couldn't find on the website these things for the grad program, grad study this year, but I'm sure they exist. I see. Yeah, so, so I'll just send these around, but don't take them seriously. Just see that they're a thing that to cite you because they do a search and your dissertation comes up as someone who's working on that. 